got a guy that goes out and he plants a bunch of wheat. Then you got, he's like, man, this is gonna be a good crop. It's gonna be awesome. Awesome. We're in South Georgia. That, that, that ground's fertile. Man, I'm telling you what, we're ready to go. Let her rip tater chip, son. Let's get her done. Then you got this, whoever comes from whatever county, most likely <coughs> Tuscaloosa, for all you Bama fans, comes and starts sowing weeds all in our stuff. And you're like, oh, come on now. So he comes in there. He's like, wait a minute. Now we got wheat and we got weeds. What are we going to do? So, first of all, the Bible says, well, get the weeds out of the way. That's a good crop, let's, let's take care of that. Now the weeds, you just gotta get down dirty, uproot them, throw them in a stack, burn them. We're done. That, that, they're, they're no good for anything. The weeds will be dealt with. He would prefer you deal with them, because as you're trying to get rid of the weeds, maybe you can say, are you sure? Come on, weed. Now, maybe you're in your stack, but maybe you can osmose and be a weed. Maybe you can, because the Lord creates miracles. Who's to say he can't do what he wants to do? It all goes back to that seed planting thing. But weed's good, weed's bad. The weeds burn, the weed multiplies. And then there you go. So if you want to know what's happening in the middle of those things, then a few minutes later, it was a lot of talk about other SEC teams and how we don't like the Big Ten. That's pretty much it. So uh, anyway, a lot of people ask the question, like, where did you find those? Well, Donnie actually goes here. He's our drummer. Come here, Donnie. There we go. Yeah, here's Donnie. We just want to make sure, like, he's, he's a real dude. There you go. We didn't give him a microphone this time, though, because he's just the drummer who sits in the back, and he doesn't like a lot of attention, but I talked him into doing this. So, But he said, when he comes out, I have to say bacon, and then... Yeah, bacon, go dogs. Go dogs. Bacon, go dogs. All right, there we go. Good to see you, man. Hey, we got a few more of these. I love it. All right. But hey, uh, well, yeah, as long as we see Donnie out there, we know we are still in our Summer Stories series, going through Jesus's parables. And what I want you to do is kind of take a, a minute to think back on the parables, the stories we've heard so far. We, we started with some parables on how we relate to God, which is also how we relate to people. So we talked about, you know, we build on the solid foundation of Jesus. We, we give and we receive mercy and we take our needs to the Father. And then we looked at the power of the kingdom of heaven, the power of the gospel. And when we say the kingdom of heaven, that's that's us. I mean, it's, it's what God has initiated. It's his way of doing things. And we got to see with that power how this kingdom spreads and the gospel spreads no matter what obstacle is set out in front of it and what the enemy might bring. Then last week, we started looking at the, those obstacles that we face as a part of being God's kingdom, being his people, the distress and the anxieties and the rejection and so much more. And so today, though, we're going to dive into some more of these obstacles, but we're going to look at one of the biggest questions people have about the kingdom of heaven, about Christianity, and that is lingering evil. If there is this kingdom here, why does evil linger. After this, though, we'll end up getting up and kind of wrapping up with three more parables, which are kind of the, just that, that extra beauty side. We'll get a glimpse of the beauty of the kingdom of heaven and, and the beauty of the gospel and being God's people. Next week, James Brown is going to be here, not the godfather of soul, but the godfather of souls. So it'll be fun to have him back. Yeah, you can cheer for that. We're happy to have him back. It's going to be a blast. So uh, we'll get a great chance to wrap up uh, before Pastor Sean comes back and looking forward to that as well. But as, as we look at this issue of lingering evil in the world, right, we, we ask ourselves this question, like, if, if we're already in the kingdom of heaven, which we are, and Jesus is victorious, which he is, not just will be, but, but he is, if he's defeated sin and death, which he has, why is there still evil? You ever ask yourself that question? 
And maybe you already know the answer. You've heard it, you've read it, whatever, and that's wonderful. And if you don't, hopefully shortly you'll, you'll understand some more. But it still leaves us with questions. What are we supposed to do about evil now? How do Christians respond when we see evil in the world, when we're faced with it ourselves? How is it all going to turn out? Is it possible that evil is impacting us, impacting you, impacting me now in ways that we don't even notice? And that's what the parable of the wheat and the weed are going to show. Let's pray as we jump into God's word. God, we simply ask today that you would give us ears to hear and hearts that are soft, that would lead to transformation in our lives, as well as in the communities all around us. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. So first, Jesus talks about two crops. And what he's showing here is that with these two crops are actually two kingdoms, right? So we're in a war between two kingdoms. Matthew 13, again, is where he is with this parable. He says he presented another parable to them. And I want to look at this maybe a little bit different. So at this point, if you're willing to indulge a little bit, stop reading. I'll, I'll still have it up here for those who want to follow along. But I encourage you, stop reading. Close your eyes for a while unless you fall asleep, right? Try not to do that and poke people next to you if you need to. What I want you to do is just uh, use the imagination a little bit. And imagine you are back in first century Roman-occupied Israel, you don't have the technology like you might have today. So you're in this agricultural kind of livestock-based society. You might love Jesus already. You might hate him and be looking for some way that you can discredit him. Maybe you're in the crowd around him because you're just curious about this guy because of what you've seen so far. But whatever the case is for you, whatever you're imagining yourself being in or whoever you actually are right now, you're intrigued by Jesus as you sit and listen to him. Maybe you've seen his miracles or just heard about them or you've just heard of some really unexpected yet authoritative teaching. And here's what he begins to tell them. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while, while people were sleeping, his enemy came, sowed we weeds among the wheat and left. When the plants sprouted and produced grain, then the weeds also appeared. And so you're either at this time, you can kind of stay in there in the imagination if you want. You're either a farmer or you're connected to a farmer. That's just how things were then. And so this, whoever you are hearing this story, absolutely infuriates you because this is messing with your family's livelihood one way or another. And so as you're hearing Jesus and you hear him talking about this occurrence, you just, you lean in, listening intently. And he goes on, the landowner's servants came to him and said, Master, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Then where do the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he told them. So do you want us to go and pull them up? The servants asked him. No, he said. When you pull up the weeds, you, you might also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At harvest time, I'll tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and tie them in bundles to burn them, but collect the wheat in my barn." Now, what he's talking about here is a weed called, and you can kind of stay there, it's an imagining thing of what you imagine wheat might look like, but the weed is called a tear or a darnel. It looks like wheat, and so it's really hard to tell the difference at first. And this darnel, this tear, it gives a really bitter taste if you cook it into anything or use it in anything you're making. And actually, in really large amounts, it can even be poisonous. But until it grows into maturity and you can see the fruit, you can see the color of grain, if, if there is actually any there, it's really hard to tell which is which. So this is a really terrible situation for the farmer and for his dependents. And so now, as you sit there in ancient Rome and Israel, you may be wondering what this has to do with the kingdom of heaven. Well, so did the disciples back then. Then he left the crowds and went into, into the house. So you're going into the house now. And Jesus is here teaching. His disciples approached him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He replied, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed. These are the children of the kingdom. 
The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. Therefore, just as the weeds are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they'll gather from his kingdom all who cause sin and those guilty of lawlessness. They'll throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. Let anyone who has ears listen. And so if you're still kind of imagining yourself in ancient Rome there, come on back. See, the first crop he talks about, that's the farmers, right? That represents, the farmer represents Jesus. And the field is the world, just like the world we live in now. And the wheat seeds that he plants, those are his followers, Christians. The second is the devil's crop. And the tear seeds, those are his followers that he has planted, that he's using out in the world. And, and so here's kind of a, a big point about farming and about the kingdom of heaven that Jesus wanted the people then to understand and that we need to understand now if we want to understand what he's talking about. And that is this. You don't sow and reap on the same day, right? You don't put the seed and then pull it right back up. So Jesus is clearing this really amazing truth. And it's one that many in the crowd had already come to believe. And what he's proclaiming is the Messiah is here. The revolution has already begun. I am bringing, I have brought the kingdom. So all of God's power is active here and now. And, and listen, it's not just back then because Jesus was physically walking, but now living and active because the spirit is here. So like the farmer plants seed, he, Jesus is saying, I'm planting the spirit in people. So those who trust me, those who trust Jesus, he says, they become citizens of the kingdom of heaven, my people, children of God. The kingdom of heaven, it enters you and it makes you a new creation. And you can finally see true reality. There's been this veil and that veil is now lifted off. The fog that's been clouding all of it, that's, that's gone. The lie is lifted, it's out. And everything about you changes because you're a part of God's kingdom. The way you think, the way you live, the way you feel, the things you've, you value. Timothy Keller says it this way. It says, the first mark of a person who's entered the kingdom of God is your life is revolutionized by the knowledge you are accepted. You are transformed by the reality that Jesus took away your sin, that he took away death. He gave you his righteousness, his goodness. He made you worthy so that you could be adopted by the Father the perfect heavenly father, the king, the creator of the universe. And he says, you are accepted. He says, you are loved. That's what he declares about us. So there's no more worrying about measuring up. There's no more worrying about being good enough. And this reality, it starts to overflow to the people around us, those communities around us in love our pride and our selfishness, our fear, our prejudice, our, our hatred, our, our envy, all of those things begin to be overcome. They are overcome when we're looking to Jesus. And so now we have the power and we have the drive. We have the ability to bring the kingdom of heaven here. It is here. We have the ability, the power, and the drive to attack evil in this world like crime and like sickness and like poverty and so many more things. And so when you see evil in the world and you think you can't do anything about it, living in the kingdom of heaven says you can't think that way anymore. And if that's how you think, if you think that this, this world, the problems are just too big and they're too messed up, you don't understand that the kingdom of heaven has already been planted here on earth. And this is completely unexpected. It's even really confusing to the crowd who's gathered around them. And, and it is to us too a lot of times. Because in this in-between time, 
where we're living now, we, we see two kingdoms. We see two orders of reality that are, that are battling, that they're vying for resources. And Jesus has to, to show that this reality, he has to show what real truth is to correct the misguided conceptions people then had of the Messiah. They had been under, if you're talking about these Israelite people, been under oppression for centuries, under Babylon and Persia and Greece. And now here they are in Rome, all of these foreign powers overruling them, and they're looking for the promised rescuer. And so in their minds, they're not thinking outside of this world. They're just thinking of rescue from the things that they can see immediately. But Jesus says, those aren't the real issues. You need more than political rescue. He says that the crop has been sown. The kingdom of heaven, a new kingdom, is here. But it hasn't been harvested yet. The weeds are still growing all around you. The enemy is mounting his own revolution and it comes with violence and hate and, and pride and selfishness and disease and decay and death and, and, and division and, and distractions and just all these things to pull us away from the kingdom. And there are going to be some areas of this field called earth that are mostly covered in weeds with barely any wheat and it's going to look so dire and desperate. And so even though the kingdom is here, God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven is here, Jesus is saying it's not going to be fully grown. It's not going to be harvest ready overnight. The conflict between the wheat and the tares remains. Spiritual war warfare continues. Evil spirits still plague us. People Governments that are still under the kingdom of Satan, they will still oppress us. There's still sin all around. Sadness, pain, loss, disease, death, decay, division, distractions, all of it still remains, even within the church sometimes, sometimes even more so. The weeds are everywhere, and it's hard to detect them. It even causes conflict and temptation and failure in our own hearts. And that's where we say, thank you, God, for grace. The crowd was expecting this Messiah to come in and just fix everything right away, the way that the entire world operated. And Jesus says, that's not how I'm working. That's not what I'm doing. But the day is coming. It will happen. He says the kingdom of heaven cannot be stopped. That's hallelujah time right there if you want to do that, right? One day the harvest is going to come and things are going to become even better than you ever hoped, ever dreamed, could ever even imagine if you're part of the kingdom of heaven. But if you fight it, if you reject the kingdom of heaven, if you reject this adoption from our heavenly father, the harvesters, the angels, they will cast you into the garbage pile as poisonous weeds. You'll be given exactly what you asked for to be separated from God. And we're really not that much different for the people in the crowd today. We come to Jesus with these misguided expectations too. You know, a lot of times we, when we're first considering Christianity, it's for the same reason the crowd did, that there's something we're desperate for. We, we just don't necessarily realize what it is. Maybe it's an obvious thing, like it's an addiction, it's a habit, it's, it's a hurt, it's, it's guilt, it's shame, it's fear. Maybe it's something you just really want to beat, but you can't. Maybe you're thinking, oh, you know what? Maybe if I tell God I believe in him and I pray to him, I'll get the thing I want. You know, it's just a way to get ahead. But if you really listen to Jesus, he'll do the same thing to you that he did with the crowd. He's going to tell you you're not getting it. That your view is just way too small. 
Because the, the kingdom of heaven is about more than just fixing your problems or a few problems. It's absolutely revolutionary. And it won't happen as quickly and as simply as pretty much any of us want. See, whatever it is you're thinking needs to change to make you happy or to bring you peace or to restore order in this world or in your life or to bring righteousness, whatever it is, is too small. Whatever you're trusting, whatever you're hoping in, whatever you're looking to to make your life or this world better, if it isn't Jesus, it's way too small. It's not world systems that are messed up. It's reality itself, and it's a mess. And the kingdom of heaven is an entirely new reality that Jesus brings. He takes every bit of reality, the, the emotional, the social, the, the physical, the political, the economic, all of it. And by his power and by his beauty and by his wisdom, even, even through his church, us, through us, he works. But always in his will, everything is made new. And we're talking beyond a restoration, beyond just getting it back to nice. He makes it perfect and brand new, beyond restored. And it all begins in the depths of our own hearts. And it starts to work its way through all of us, each of us individually, out to others, and it spreads out to all of creation. It's like we talked about with a mustard seed, it's growing, it's expanding. But in the in-between time, it's hard. We long for everything to be right. It's what we want, but, but what does the farmer, what does Jesus say? Be patient. How many of y'all got so irritated when you'd hear your mom and dad tell you be patient when you were growing up? It's hard, right? How do we do this? We have to remember that we are in a war between two kingdoms, but God will win. See, impatience starts to show in a couple of ways. Our impatience shows sometimes in condemnation and sometimes in cynicism. Avoid both of those. See, well, sometimes we'll condemn other people, we'll condemn churches, we'll condemn ourselves because we think everything should be right, right away, and we forget the in-between battle. This is this morning, the elders, a couple of the elders, they, they come and they pray over kind of everyone who's leading from the platform. And one of the things we all kind of went around and noted, it's just been a tough weekend. You know, things have been hard and we just, we just needed prayer over it. But when we don't see things happening in our timing, we're, we're often tempted to, to turn to worldly methods to fix things in our own power. I want this done in my timing, in my way. So we might put our hope in politicians. We might elevate our own passions and preferences. We might attack people. And we're trying to bring change without love. And what ends up happening is we're giving our resources over to the weeds. And we start to cause division and pain and distract people from God's glory. But when we remember that the harvest is coming, we're stable. We might see success in ministry. I'm not talking like vocational ministry. I guess it, it could be, but just all those things that the Lord has called us to do in the world, we see some success and we're thankful for it, but we know that the enemy is still at work. And so we know then that the next time things may not work out the same way. And until the harvest, even our best days and our successes, those are still tainted. They're not as good as they could be. Or maybe you tend to go the other way though and you get cynical. And you just give up or you get bitter and then you stop growing. You stop spreading the gospel, working for the kingdom. But when you remember the harvest is coming, you can say, yeah, you know what? I was hurt. That was tough. But God's going to set everything right. Things haven't been going day well, well today, this, this time period, but one day they will. And God, I know you're working to grow me. You're working to make me holy. You're working to bring me joy. Do you have the stability in your life that comes from knowing the kingdom of heaven is like farming? 
There's this really not fancy theological term we use for this. We just say already not yet. It's an amazing truth, right? That the kingdom is here, but it's not harvested yet. And so, so Paul writes to the Romans this, this amazing truth to help us remember the harvest is coming, that God wins and that you can trust him even though it's not here just yet. Romans 8, 28, we know all things work together for the good of those who love God, for Christians, his people, who are called according to his purpose. Now hear, hear this too. This doesn't mean that he turns every bad thing into a good thing. But he providently weaves all things into his perfect plan. In the book of Job, you see Satan, he had to ask permission from God to go and test Job. And everything Satan did ended up serving God's plan. And it's a hard book to read because of just the desperation and the difficulty in it. But if you think about it from this perspective of God and Satan, there's even some humor here because God only allows Satan, he only allows evil enough rope to hang himself. So whatever Satan does only works against him in the end. You think about the Garden of Eden where the very first sin happens and people say, we think we can become like God. That's our thing. We don't want to have to serve him. So they, they eat this forbidden fruit tempted by Satan. What happens? Death and decay and all these horrible things come into the world, but it frees up. What, what ends up happening is through sin, God reveals his grace and his righteousness and this plan that will end up destroying Satan. Just a little while later, a few centuries later, you have people coming together. They're all gathering around to, again, make a name for themselves and build this huge tower at Babel, wanting to say that we can be like God. And so what does God do? He divides their language. And when he divides their language, so Satan has led people to go and, and try to equate themselves to God. And then God divides their language. And what do they end up doing? They spread out amongst themselves, amongst people who speak their language. And they end up going and filling and multiplying to the ends of the earth, which was the original command in the first place. Fast forward further. Joseph, God has promised that he's going to raise a people through Abraham's line. Joseph is going to be this guy. And yet it looks like his whole family is going to die. He's sold into slavery. But God uses that sale of Joseph into slavery to humble him and bring him then into a powerful position where all of his family is able to survive a famine. Satan, his plan didn't work out. Judas, a disciple of Jesus, followed him and lived right there with him. Sold him out to crucifixion for 30 pieces of silver. Satan thought he had won. Jesus is crucified. He's dead. How does that work out for Satan? Yeah. Jesus overcomes sin and death. Works out pretty well for us. See, knowing God wins, that is what helps us to be patient. So we don't have to take up the enemy's methods as we sit in these battles. We can patiently trust God and we can battle God's way. It's like we see in Ephesians 6. If you look at verses 11 through 17, I encourage you to go check that out later. But what we see are God's weapons of how we are meant to fight. It's truth, righteousness, goodness, the gospel of peace, faith, God's word, the Bible, and through prayer. When times are hard, when you're facing evil, are those your immediate go-to weapons? Because that's how Christians fight. That's how we persevere. That's how we grow. Is that you? I know it's not all the time, but are we growing in these things? Because see, we are in a war between two kingdoms that God will win for his people. And there's absolutely nothing more important in the life than knowing the difference between these two crops and these two kingdoms, than knowing which one you belong to, if you are his people or not. Because these two crops, they're growing up side by side. They even look the same, which leads to a very difficult realization. There are people intentionally planted in this world who look like Christians. And it's an intentional plan of the enemy to fight God. So we are all going to know some people who are very kind, very moral, may seem very loving, might even be very spiritual or religious. Some of them will claim to be Christians. 
even, even being within the church. But come harvest time, maybe before, they're going to be shown to have no grain. Or the grain they do have is going to be false grain, bitter, poisonous. And you're going to see that they're not Christian. So why would the enemy do this? Well, think about this. It lures people into this false security and they end up never really trusting Jesus to save them because they're just saying, oh, I'm doing good things. I must be okay. What happens when someone we look up to as Christian, as a Christian, kind of a Christian leader, what happens when they abandon Jesus? We see it all the time and it should be expected based on the parable, but it still hurts. And if the enemy can keep you from seeing the truth and turning to Jesus instead of trusting yourself, he wins every time, even if we start looking holy. If the enemy can get people thinking they're Christian and running around, though, and and displaying pride and judgment and condemnation, it starts pushing people away. And so this means that there are people who think they're Christian and they aren't, which is a scary thought, right? Maybe they come to church. Maybe they prayed a prayer or said they had at some point. They think, oh, that's enough. Maybe you think you, if you live by Christian values, like you do the right things, you do a lot of Christian stuff, that that's good. And those are good things to do, but it doesn't save you by these works. Is it possible then that such a, such a person just looks like wheat? How do you know? I want to give a couple of tests. First, Christians are children of the kingdom of heaven. We, we know we're planted, and we know it is miraculous. See, Jesus, if you've noticed these past few parables, they all have to do with agriculture, with planting. And Jesus is using this planting, this sowing metaphor in part, because seeds don't plant themselves. Here, what we see is the farmer does all of it. So Christians realize that that even though there there may have been searching and there might be some other people who are involved in the process, your salvation is an act of God. It's the thing that Jesus has done. Someone outside guided you down the path through the Holy Spirit. And it sparked your interest. And it helped you see the truth and repent to turn toward God. So if you think that Christianity is is something that you do or something that you earn, that you have to kind of build up yourself or some kind of like self-reformation to align with a biblical idea, you're not getting what it means to be a part of the kingdom of heaven or how one enters into this kingdom. See, unless you've experienced the power of God revolutionizing your life, reaching into you to change you from the core, you're not getting it. This doesn't have to be some kind of like dramatic crisis type experience. Well, it can be. But Christians know we're miraculous. That God has stepped in and done something beyond us. Which then continues into that second test that we talked about last week. How do you know you're a Christian? There is miraculous grain. There's fruit. There is life change. There is growth. There is transformation over time. And in the end, Christians, we become more like Jesus. We receive grace, we see his beauty, and then it begins to overflow more and more in love to others. It overflows in repentance. And you've got kind of the the moralist side who, who is trying to do this on their own, the moralist, the weeds that produce false works. And and for this person, it it's a duty kind of thing instead of grace. They're trying to work and to earn. It's not about love. It's about appearance. It's about achievement. The Christian finds satisfaction more and more, not perfectly, but we find satisfaction more and more simply in God. Moralists are going to appear to to do that, to to grow in their appreciation for God. but, But really what's happening for the moralist is Jesus plus something. Jesus, if I obey you, I I should be healthy. Jesus, if I obey you, I should have this prestige or this reputation. Christians grow content with God more and more. 
Weeds are going to lose contentment when they face loss and when they face hard times. And we'll all be tempted with that, right? It is the temptation. But the difference is that for the moralist, Jesus is not enough. For the Christian, he's your hope. And again, this contentment, this love, this repentance, this peace, it all grows over time in Christians. It doesn't come all at once. The Christian grows in humility. We see more of our sin. We see then more of God's holiness in light of the sin. And so we take our sin to the cross where we can receive more grace And for the Christian, the more we see our sin, the more we see our wickedness, the more we feel loved. And it's completely unique to Christians, to this kingdom. So are you growing in this? As it happens, as it it just kind of overflows out of you to others in humility, with sensitivity, with compassion, with love, and it changes you over time. So if if you're hearing me saying that that true Christians produce fruit and a true Christian produces growth and your response is, okay, I've got to go out and I've got to do more. You're missing the point. That's the way the weeds think. That's the way the tares think. Now, if you're hearing this and, and you're realizing you thought you were wheat, but now you're not so sure. Listen, Jesus wants you to be sure about this. Ask him. And you could pray something like this. If you want to right now, you can repeat after me if you want to. But it could be anything like this. Jesus, I don't know if I'm really yours, but I want to. You are the only way I can be accepted. I need you to plant me. Only your sacrifice takes away my sin. Only your Holy Spirit grows me. You are my king. I give myself to you. See, what this is, this is a call, this this parable is a call to repent, to take things to the cross and experience freedom. Don't keep that to yourself, though. Talk to somebody here. Like We want to share these stories together as one kingdom, one community. Tell people what God is doing in your life. If you're feeling overwhelmed by the weight of evil around you, and how it just seems to be growing and the way that that evil is influencing you and the people around you. Look to Jesus. Trust that he is going to work in you as you use his weapons of warfare. Jesus confronted the self-righteous and the oppressors in those days he was walking here, but not with the world's weapons. That's what a lot of people wanted them to do. But he got to the root of evil. He got to sin and he overcame the sin. Not with protests, not with swords, not through politics. He prayed, he lived righteously, he leaned on the Bible and he loved people. Go and do likewise. Let's pray. Father, we need these weapons because we live in such an evil time. I experience it myself, and I know so many in this room online experience the evil of the world. Thank you for prayer. Thank you for your word. Thank you for just your Holy Spirit empowering us to live in ways that overcomes all of these things. As we go into a broken world, encourage us knowing that the harvest is coming, that you are working to set everything right. We ask in Christ's name, amen. So as you begin to prepare your heart to remember how Jesus won this battle by taking communion, the worship team is gonna begin to play. We're gonna do things just a little bit different today. See, when when evil begins to, to overwhelm you, when you feel disconnected, from Jesus, if if you know you're trusting him for salvation, there's this beautiful song that that helps you remember Jesus and remember, remember the miracle that you are and to rest in him. So the worship team, they are gonna be singing the song, He Will Hold Me Fast. I'd encourage you to just kind of be still and sit and listen. Let the truth sink into your core and then take communion. Sing along if you'd like, or just kind of sit and let it, let it soak. But it's a miracle of God to hold you fast. 
and he will do it. 